thank you for tuning in to Hill and Emerge Radio Broadcast. My name is Quandria Patterson. So we are talking this month from the topic, The Power to Forgive Sin. And we are talking about Jesus having the power to forgive sin. We are looking at the book of Matthew, chapter number 9. And the first week... Um, that we went over this, we asked the question, is your faith active? And we talked about Jesus uh, being able to forgive the paralytic when he told him that his sins are forgiven. And when he told him that his sins are forgiven, how people were judging him, the scribes in particular, and they were saying that Jesus is blaspheming, meaning he's um, acting as if he's God, like he's he's offending God with his God-like ways. And Jesus, we did also talk about Jesus being the fulfillment of the word, that the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees had took this law of Moses and and learned it, and read it, and interpreted it, and then enforced it to the point to where they thought that they were all-knowing, and they, and that they were God, so they played God in society, and when Jesus came, Jesus didn't come to enforce the law, he came to fulfill the law, so the power that they had given themselves to enforce the law. The scribes, the Pharisees, the, the scribes, the Pharisees, and the Sadducees. Jesus was was the enforcement. He was the 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 word. So when he came, and 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 he was the living word. They were using the word to kill and to destroy. Jesus, the living word, came to give life. Because when God made the Ten Commandments, he never made the Ten Commandments to kill people. He made the Ten Commandments to push people towards him, to draw people towards him. These are the things that you don't do so that you are more in line with with my spirit and who I am and that brings you closer to me that that is how your love for me is demonstrated that is how you engage me that is how I am able to operate on your behalf and that's how how love is generated in the atmosphere and life is brought about. And that is what the law of Moses was supposed to do. So people who did not obey the law, then there were consequences to that. And it was an effort to put people back into right relationship with God. And the Pharisees, the Sadducees, and the scribes, and the interpreters of the law that day saw it as a power thing saw it strictly as a um a enforcement thing if you don't do this then we are the authority and we will deal with you accordingly and so that was that was the um thing that attracted them to it because they weren't even living by the same standards that they were enforcing a lot of the time. So it was it couldn't have been for them about the law and the law being um something that God put into place as a as a means to get people closer to him and to understand how to live and function in a way that was pleasing to him. It was all about the power for them. When Jesus came, it was all about saving people. Scripture says that he didn't come to 
condemn. He came to save. And he didn't come to judge. He came to save. He came to restore people back to their proper relationship with God. And that was a problem for the people who wanted power. Because Jesus was more powerful. Because Jesus was God in the flesh. More, more powerful. He was the authority. And so that caused conflict. And we talked about that um, last week. So when he comes and he says in um, Matthew chapter 9, verses 1 through 13 is what we read that first week. And he's telling the paralytic, um, your sins are forgiven. They're like, who, who does he think he is to say that to forgive anybody of their sins? Because they didn't have that power to do that. So they felt like he couldn't he couldn't be more powerful than they are because they are the ultimate power here on earth. And really they thought they thought that they were the ultimate power, period. They were operating in a in a satanic principle, trying to be God. And so Jesus looked at them and said like pretty much why do you have a problem with me saying your sins are forgiven which is an easy thing but in order to um go one step further i'll tell him arise take up your bed and go home and that's what he did and when he told the paralytic to do that he did that and so he was constantly demonstrating that i am the real deal but because it it affected their their positioning because they didn't want people to start following Jesus and then they become irrelevant or non-factors. So they had to squash Jesus' scene because they still needed to be powerful because that's what it was all about for them. So we talked about that the first week and we talked about is your faith active? Um, Jesus went and he talked to the sinners. He, you know, he sat with tax collectors and he told um Matthew who was a tax collector when he went by him after he had performed that miracle um uh, for the paralytic he said follow me and Matthew just dropped everything that he had and he followed Jesus and the whole thing about your faith being active is it is your faith reflecting your belief that God is a healer, that God is a provider, that God is a deliverer, that God is the God of peace. And if you are anxious, the scripture says, be anxious for nothing, but in everything with prayer and thanksgiving, with supplication, make your request made known unto God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your heart and your mind in Christ Jesus. So do you believe that God can um, settle that anxiety? Do you believe that God can deliver from addiction? Do you believe that God wants you well? Do you believe that he can heal? When people um, are... Um, taken away from us in this life do you believe that if they had that relationship with God that to be absent from this body is to be present with him and that they are present with him and that they are um, at peace and their spirit is is happy because if you believe all of that then you should have a be in a state on this side of life that that you're okay that you're okay that God is in control and that God has it that whatever you go through that all things work together for good to him who loves God and who are called according to what his purpose is if you believe all these things, then when you experience life, 
then you see it from a different perspective. Is your faith active? Do you believe all of what the word tells you? And if you do, is that reflected in your life? Are you at peace? Is the joy of the Lord your strength? Is your faith active? So we talked about that the first week. And then the second week, we talked about, um, we came from Matthew chapter 9, verses 14 through 17. And we talked about, are you mixing the old with the new? And if so, then how is that working out for you? And we looked at scriptures where Jesus gave several different examples of we talked about um him comparing himself to a bridegroom and how he was saying that while while he's here um while the bridegroom is here they're celebrated because there were other disciples of John the Baptist um and the fair who was comparing Jesus disciples with the Pharisees and with their practices and they were saying why do we fast but but Jesus disciples asking Jesus your disciples don't and Jesus was pretty much saying that while I am here um I'm they're going to um celebrate me or they're going to um take everything that they can from me so it'll be time for them to do fasting and the things that you practice when I'm not here when the, and he used the bridegroom being um there as an example and his question was can friends of the bridegroom mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them but the days will come when the bridegroom will be taken away from them and then they will fast but he used that to kind of um demonstrate that while I'm here he knew his time was short that that they're getting everything that they need to get to prepare them for when I leave. And when that happens, then you'll start seeing them do things that maybe you're doing now, but they know that I'm here. They know who I am. Other people are trying to be convinced of who I am, but the ones who know who I am, they're acting like they know who I am. He also gave the example of a piece of unshrunk garment that whenever you're getting ready to combine two different materials that you, you have to pre-shrink. You'll see that on some things. You pre-shrink it so that when you put it together, one doesn't shrink and pull away from the other whenever you're sewing things together in garment. I mean, using that to uh, create something even like a quilt or any anything um clothing wise and so he was giving the example that you don't you don't mix old with new that you make them compatible and then you put them together and he also gave a third example of putting um, new wine into old wine skin. He said, you don't do that. And when we said mixing the old with the new, that was the scripture that we were really taken from. Because what he was saying is once you're new, once you're born again and you accept Jesus as your personal Lord and Savior, you become born again and you become filled with new wine. The Holy Spirit comes. You become filled with that Holy Spirit. That New wine shouldn't be in an old body. So when you, it says old things are passed away and all things become new. And we're going to go to that scripture um, a little bit later. But that's what this is talking about. You don't pour, you don't say, oh, I'm born again and um, I'm saved and I'm different now. But you your mouth and your words are saying one thing but the actions of your body when people look at you you're you're still acting the same old way that there is an issue there you can't you can't have new speech with old action you can't have new wine 
being in old wine skin. And then what it said in 17 is, nor do they put new wine in old wine skin or else the wine skin breaks. So what I interpret that to be in the analogy that I'm giving is that it, it doesn't hold. You see people, they saying one thing one minute, the next minute they saying something else. So they doing something, they might go to church and have an experience and then the next thing you know they they're acting the same way it doesn't even look like the same person it's it doesn't stick if you're trying to do this new thing with old actions with old deeds it doesn't work the example here says that the wine skin breaks when that happens and the wine is spilled and the wine skins are ruined but they put new wine into new wine skin and they're both preserved. So whenever you're saying, um, I'm new, I made a decision, I've repented, I'm going in a different direction, I'm not that same person, then then when people see you, it should your 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 look should reflect that this newness that you're saying, that you're speaking that's coming out of you is reflected in 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 your temple your body which is holding that newness and if not Jesus is saying that's a problem in that scripture so the question from last week was are you mixing the old with the new and if you are then how is that working and I use this scripture to um, demonstrate the fact that that doesn't work. This week, our question is going to be, do you believe that Jesus is able to do this? And that's whatever this is in your life. Do you believe that Jesus is able to do this? Whatever needs to be done for you in your life. And we're going to come from Matthew chapter 18 through 31 and we'll make that question um, plug into the scripture and you'll understand and see that a little bit clearer once we get into it now let's go ahead and read our foundation scripture which always comes from Isaiah chapter 55 verses 8 to 11 and it reads for my thoughts are not your thoughts nor are my ways nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. For as the rain comes down and the snow from heaven, and do not return there, but water the earth, and make it bring forth in bud, that it may give seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes forth from my mouth. It shall not return to me void, but it shall accomplish what I please, and it shall prosper in the thing which I sent it. And today, all I want to say um, following that reading is, what is it in your life that God has promised you? He's saying that his word will not return void, but it will prosper and it will accomplish what he sent it out to do. So if he gave you a personal word, we call that a rhema word, a word just for you. If he gave you that personal word and it still hasn't manifested, he's saying here that his word will not return void. It will accomplish what he pleases, whatever he sent it to do, it'll happen and it will not return to him void. So I encourage you to keep believing that God has not forgotten. Now we're going to go to Matthew chapter 6, verses 9 to 11. And this is Jesus telling his disciples to pray, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day 
our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And following that prayer today, I say trust and believe that this is God's kingdom, that the power and the glory is his and his alone. And whatever you see that's contrary to his love and what his word says is not his power. And that power has an expiration date. God's power is from everlasting to everlasting. And it will not fail. And it will show itself strong. As the as the only authority. Right now, and some people might say, well, it, it don't look like it. But trust and believe that God is has the power, the glory, and the kingdom belongs to him. Make no mistake about that. In Jesus' name, amen. So now let's go ahead and get into our reading um, for today's scripture. Again, the question is, do you believe that Jesus is able to do this? Whatever this is, do you believe? Um, Verse 18, Matthew chapter 9, and it reads, While he spoke these things to them, Behold, a ruler came and worshipped him, saying, My daughter has just died, but come and lay your hand on her, and she will live. So Jesus arose and followed him. So did his disciples. And suddenly a woman who had a flow of blood for twelve years came from behind and touched the hem of his garment. For she said to herself, If only I may touch his garment, I shall be made well. But Jesus turned around, and when he saw her, he said, Be of good cheer, daughter. Your faith has made you well. And the woman was made well from that very hour. When Jesus came into the ruler's house and saw the flute players and the noisy crowd wailing, He said to them, make room for the girl is not dead, but sleeping. And they ridiculed him. But when the crowd was put aside, was put outside, he went in and took her by the hand and said, and the girl arose. And the report of this went out into all the land. So here we see a couple of things happening. We see um, somebody coming to him, a ruler, saying his daughter is dead. And then the disciples was telling him, I mean, and then Jesus went to go and heal her and his disciples went. But on his way to going to heal her, a woman with an issue of blood for 12 years came and in her faith said, if I could just touch the hem of his garment, I will be made well. And he looked back and saw her and said, be of good cheer. Your faith has made you well. And at the same time, he's proclaiming to make room for him that this daughter that this ruler is saying is dead is not dead. She's just sleeping. Remember, the question is, do you believe that Jesus is able to do this, whatever this is? And this example, that this was a daughter that had died. And a woman who had been having an issue of blood for 12 years. The ruler believed when he came to get Jesus. He believed that Jesus was able to do this. Was able to bring his daughter back to life. The woman with the issue of blood for 12 years when she saw him walking. She was like, I know if I just touched that garment that I can be made well. I know he can do this. She believed he was able to do this. And for her, the this was heal me of this issue. 
I don't care if it's been, it, it wasn't one year, it wasn't two years, it wasn't 10 years. This was 12 years. But I, in her mind, it didn't matter how long it was. She believed that he could do this. And he did. He made her well. Those were two examples. Chapter number, I mean, verse number 27, when we continue to read, it says, when Jesus departed from there, two blind men followed him, crying out and saying, Son of David, have mercy on us. And when he had come into the house, the blind men came to him and said, and Jesus said to them, do you believe? That I am able to do this. And that's where our question comes from. Jesus asking the two blind men. Do you believe. That I am able to do this. They said to him. Yes Lord. Yes Lord. When you ask yourself that question. Whatever your this is. And we've seen some big this is. So far in this, in the passages that we're reading, whatever your this is, do you believe that Jesus is able to do this? And that's a question you answer to him. Jesus asking these two blind men directly, do you believe that I'm able to do this? He's checking their belief, checking their faith. Is their faith active? And they said, yes, Lord. Yes, Lord, I believe. Then he touched their eyes, saying, according to your faith, let it be to you. And their eyes were opened, and Jesus sternly warned them, saying, see that no one knows it. Now, you see this a couple of times in Scripture. So, you know, Jesus is not doing things for his own recognition. He He's saying, um, um in many points in scripture, don't tell nobody that I did this. And and this is one of those times. He said, see that no one knows it, but when they say, but when they departed, they spread the news about him in all the country. So it didn't stop them because they were so excited about their healing. But Jesus wasn't going around doing the work of God so that, um, he could he could be um, glorified. That's how we know he was God. Because God does things out of love, not out of popularity, not out of um, stardom. So he can so he can get, you know, the followers or what have you. He does it out of love. And when we are called by God. We are called by God to spread the gospel of Jesus, to spread the love of Jesus so that people can be healed, so that people can be delivered, and so that people can be set free, so that we can start to see the manifestation of God on earth and that people will be drawn to that and healing can take place in the land. Do you believe that Jesus is able to do this? When you look out on these streets, when you see the news, when you see the day-to-day, -day, all of the negativity, all of the killings, all of the hatred, when you see that, and it just seems like it's just overwhelming and, and all the time, do you believe that God can do this? That God can turn that around? That love conquers all? That that love trumps hate do you believe that there is nothing too hard for god and that with god all things are possible do you believe that jesus can do this like jesus said to the two blind men do you believe that i am able to do this and if you are struggling with believing that today, I pray just like Jesus caused those two blind men to see that he causes you to see the truth about who he is and that you walk in that truth and that that truth changes your life and change you for the good to where you can be saved and walk in the newness of life so that you can be healed, delivered and set free. And until next week, 
be blessed in Jesus' name.